Good morning everyone. Welcome back to another English video lecture. Now this is the second part of our video lecture on we are not afraid to die if we can all be together. Now a lot of you haven't been attending my online classes, especially commerce section. So I'm going to call you guys out again. Please attend the online lectures otherwise you're going to miss out on a lot of information. Okay, I can't put everything that I have to say in these videos. That's the reason why we have online classes. So these two things work together. So that's the reason why you are asked to attend online classes. If you're not attending online classes, then you're missing out on so much information, so many discussions, so many question and answers that we deal with, so much uh, documentary footage that we see re regarding the chapter. So there's a lot of extra information that I provide to you in the online classes, which I can't provide to you in the video because there is a certain time limit, right? I can't be uploading like two hour long videos on YouTube. That's not how it's done. You won't even watch, you're not even watching 30 minute video. So do you really expect me to believe that you'll watch a two hour long video? So you're not either watching the videos or you're not attending the online classes. So please stop doing that. Like pay a little bit more uh, attention to these classes. I know this is English. A lot of you take it very lightly. Uh, but please make an effort, make a concerted effort to be present at all the online classes. All right. Anyways, for the rest of you who, guys, who have been regular, who have been attending online classes regularly and watching the videos, good job. Kudos to you guys. Uh, you guys are an inspiration to all the rest of these people who aren't attending classes and who aren't doing their work on time. So keep it up. Uh, keep up the good work. I hope I could reward you for it by doing something, but I don't know. Like, I can't really do anything from here. So we'll just wait. Excuse me. I had to scratch my ear once again. Yeah. Otherwise, I would have normally cut that part out, but now I'm not cutting parts out because I'm also practicing and doing like my monologues in one take instead of, you know, 20, 30 takes and then trying to find the right one. Uh, yeah, so this is good practice for me as well. Like I said, we're both learning. We're all learning together. So let's just, uh, you know, keep the environment of the class like conducive to learning. Make sure that nobody feels judged. Make sure that nobody feels, you know, stupid actually. Like, let's not make feel anybody stupid. Even the people who will be joining the class for the first time or anything else, you know, the online lectures. Anyway, so this is this is going to be our intro, by the way. I'm not going to record a very long intro. Also, like a lot of people said, like either they want voiceovers or they want video. So I'm not really sure what I was supposed to do. So for this video, I'll stick to like the voiceover format or maybe like I'll put in a little bit more footage and everything else, but I'll do the voiceover more in this footage. And then like for the next video, I'll do like the monologue and then for the next video, I'll do voiceover. So I'll try to like do it alternatively because I was trying to do it like half the video with an explanation and half the video with a voiceover. Uh, but I don't really know how to make that work yet. I've tried it with class 12. If I get a good response, then I'll do it with you guys as well. But for today, for this video, since this is the second part of our lecture, I'll be focusing more on the text and the direct explanation of the text instead of, you know, all the side stuff that I usually give you, the background information, which I have already provided to you quite a bit. Okay. Uh, so yeah, and if you haven't attended the online lectures, well, uh, online classes, well, you're going to miss out on the information. And if you're concerned about what you're missing out, then please reach out to me after this class. Please reach out to me. Then like message me at least if you're not attending the class, just send me a message on WhatsApp, sir. I will not be attending the class today. So at least I know that you have a reason or something. Don't just disappear. All right, people. Anyways, without further ado, let's just get into the explanation and get done with the second part of this chapter. <laughs> now we'll be taking a look at page number one. So uh, those of you who have attended the online class, you and I have already done this. So you don't really need to pay attention to this. You can skip forward to the next part of the video where everything else is explained, which I haven't covered in the online class. Uh, the rest of you who didn't attend the online class, well, you missed out because I showed the maps where Captain James Cook, like how his voyage went and everything else. We calculated like how heavy the ship is. Actually, we had a lot of fun on the online class. So you guys missed out on that. And I'm not going to do the explanation again. So you had to find out the meaning of these words from these uh, in the text, honing our seafaring skills, spin tricks in the vast ocean, ominous silence, a tousled head, or a tousled head, which is what we learned that day, that's how it's pronounced, and Mayday Calls. All right, so the story is set in July 1976. There's the narrator is a 37-year-old businessman. Uh, he has a wife whose name is Mary. He has a son whose name is Jonathan, who's six years old, daughter Suzanne, whose name is seven years old. <clears throat> All right. So they had dreamt of sailing in the wake of the famous explorer, the famous explorer being Captain James Cook. So they had dreamt of sailing in the same route that he did 200 years ago. Uh, so the boat was called the Wave Walker. It was 23 meters long and 30 ton heavy. It was wooden hulled. Now I've explained wooden hulls and everything else as well in the online lectures. So I'll put some resources here in this video as well, like I usually do, footages and clips, etc. 
Well, this is basically it. The first leg of our planned three year, 105,000 kilometer journey passed pleasantly as we sailed down the west coast of Africa to Cape Town. Now, I showed this on the map as well. What is the west coast of Africa? What does Cape Town look like? All right, so they took on two crewmen, Larry Vigil and Swiss Herb Siegler. So now these are the two people that joined them in Cape Town. Remember that if, there's, uh, if this is a question in your objective types, you have to remember. Okay, so the American guy's name was Larry Vigil. The Swiss guy's name was Herb Siegler. And they helped them tackle one of the world's roughest seas, the Southern Indian Ocean. Now, those of you who were with me in the online class, I uh, showed you guys like the footage of ships in the Southern Indian Ocean. So we all know how rough it is. For those of you who don't know what it looks like, uh, I'll put a little bit of the clip here as well after this if I find the time. Otherwise, you can just Google Southern Indian Ocean. All right, so let's move on to the next page. Now our story continues in their second day out of Cape Town. They begin to encounter strong gales. Strong gales mean strong winds. For the next weeks, they blew continuously. Gales did not worry me, but the size of the waves was alarming, up to 15 meters, as high as our mainmast. Now the footage I just shared previously uh, shows you like what a, a rough ocean looks like, what a ship deals with when it's going through giant waves and everything else. So December 25th found us 3,500 kilometers east of Cape Town. Despite atrocious weather, we had a wonderful holiday complete with the Christmas tree. New Year's Day saw no improvement in the weather, but we reasoned that it had to change soon. And it did change for the worse. All right. So just like I said, uh, the sea is a very fickle mistress. You don't really know like when the temperature is going to change, when the weather is going to change. If a storm is going to hit you or not, are the waves going to stay calm? Are the waves going to stay aggressive? Like you don't really know anything. All right. Uh, especially like back in 1976, like the amount of equipment they had on the ship must be pretty limited. Like it's uh, like I've explained in the online lecture as well, like the electronics and everything else that modern ships use are uh, vastly superior to the ones they had available in the 1970s. All right. At dawn on January 2nd, the waves were gigantic. We were sailing with only a small storm jib and were still making eight knots. 
Uh, now I'll explain this in the online lecture, like what a storm jib was, what eight knots is. So I'm just going to read through this and move on quickly. Uh, as the ship rose to the top of each wave, we could see endless enormous seas rolling towards us, and the screaming of the wind and spray was painful to the ears. To slow the boat down, we dropped the storm jib, lashed a heavy mooring rope in a loop across the stern, then we double lashed everything, went through our life raft drill, attached lifelines, joined all skins and life jackets, and waited. The first indication of impending disaster came at about 6 p.m. with an ominous silence. The wind dropped and the sky immediately grew dark. Then came a growing roar and an enormous cloud towered aft of the ship. With horror, I realized that it was not a cloud, but a wave like no other I had ever seen. It appeared perfectly vertical and almost twice the height of the other waves with a frightful breaking crest. The roar increased to a thunder as the stern moved up the face of the wave and for a moment I thought we might ride over it. But then a tremendous explosion shook the deck. A torrent of green and white water broke over the ship, my head smashed into the wheel and I was aware of flying overboard and sinking below the waves. I accepted my approaching death. As I was losing consciousness, I felt quite peaceful. Unexpectedly, my head popped out of the water. A few meters away, wave walkers were near capsizing, her mast almost horizontal. Then a wave hurled her upright, my lifeline jerked out, I grabbed the guardrails and sailed through the air into the wave walker's main boom. Subsequent waves tossed me around the deck like a rag doll, my left ribs cracked, my mouth filled with blood and broken teeth. Somehow, I found the wheel, lined up the stern for the next wave and hung on. Water, water everywhere. I could feel that the ship had water below, but I dared not abandon the wheel to investigate. All right, so I've given you a read through, and if you were in the online lecture, now I've uh, explained everything else, like what does a life raft drill is, what is the lifeline, what is oil skin, what are life jackets. And this is the reason why I keep telling you people to attend online lectures because I'm not going to keep repeating everything over and over again because like otherwise there is no point. Otherwise the people who are actually like we are putting in the time to attend the online lectures and everything else, they are losing out. It's not the people who are absent that are missing out because you are absent, you are already missing out. It's the people who are attending and then they have to listen to me again explaining the same thing that they attended. Like it's unfair to them. So don't do it people like please attend the online lectures. All right. So I'll just go through a quick explanation of this page. So small jib is a kind of sail that is used to slow your ship down anyways. So I think I've explained this as well uh, at the bottom. Mast, horizontal mast is the part of the ship where the sails are attached. Boom is the horizontal part of the ship. In fact, I'll uh, put a link to a video which explains all the different parts of the ships just right after this. Generally divide the sailboat up into four main categories or segments. And the first one we're going to take a look at here is the hull. So the hull is now in blue and the hull is just the floating device, let's say. So it's what most people would consider being the boat. It's the, it's the part that provides buoyancy and it supports everything else. So everything else is attached to the hull, the mast, the sails, all the rigging. And without the hull, that would, that would just be no boat. So the hull consists of all kinds of different parts and I'll go over them briefly in a next diagram. And there's gonna be a, an entire video, which I'll link to in the cards and in the description below. So click on that if you're interested. The next segment in red here is the mast. And the mast is the long standing pole which hold the sails. And it's what gives sailboats their, well, their characteristic shape in a way. <laughs> It's crucial for any sailboat. Without a mast, it would just be a regular power boat. So next segment is the sails. And the sails are, well, it speaks for itself, right? It's the part which propels the boat, let's say. Most modern sailboats will have two sails up, but you can use a variety of other specialty sails. And I did an entire video on sail types, going into depth about everything there's to know about sail types. So in this video, I'll walk you through all the names for different parts of the sails, the names for different kind of sails. So with that video, you're going to be up to speed on how to call each and every different sail. So the way the mast and the sails are set up on the boat is called the rig type. The most common rig type is the Bermuda sloop, which is what you see here, which, which is a triangular mainsail, one head sail, which is the jib and uh, one mast holding them up. There are all kinds of different configurations out there like gaff rigs, catch rigs, tall ships, which is a bit of the pirate ships, 
in a way because it's not completely correct to call them pirate ships. And I did a complete video explaining all these different rig types. So if you're interested in recognizing all these different kinds of boats, I, I really recommend you checking that one out. So my last segment is the rigging. And the rigging is probably the most complex category of all of them. The rigging is the way in which the sails are attached to the mast. And these are, well, it consists of all kinds of lines and cables and spars and hardware. So we're going kind of fast here. So I really recommend you just skipping back after you're done watching this video and just clicking the, the cards or go into the description, which will contain all the links and just in a relaxed way, go through all of these videos because it will give you a very broad and comprehensive view of all the sailboat parts. Actually, I'll put them in a playlist and I'll link to the playlist at the end of the video. So let's move on to a general overview of the most important parts. So if you take anything away from this video, I just want you to know the four main segments and these couple of parts. You see that the down most, most downward part is the keel and the keel is what holds the boat upright in a way. It's a bit of a stabilizing part for the sailboat. Not all sailboats have a keel though, but most seaworthy blue water sailboats do. Well, the hull itself, which is actually the bad top, <laughs> let's say. <laughs> Don't tell other sailors I'm calling it a bad bathtub because it's a bit I think it's a bit of cursing but all right the most front part is called the bow and the most back part aft part is called the stern and attached to the stern you see the rudder or rudders in this way in this case and the rudder is attached to the helm or the wheel so you'll find that a lot of marine or nautical terms are just they're referring to very ordinary parts and in regular life it would, it would be called a rope or a wheel but well we sailors we like to make things difficult well there's actually a reason of course but that's not for this video the top part of the hull is called a deck this is the part well everybody knows the deck i guess it's the part you walk on and you got the cockpit and the cockpit is just well, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's the place where you steer, where you drive the boat. So let's move up to the mast and the sails. So you got the main mast, which is the long standing pole in the center. And the mast has a horizontal spar, which is called the boom. And the main sail is attached to this boom. And the most front sail is regularly called the jib. So now you're up to speed with the most common sailboat parts all sailboats have these parts even um, other rig types and other uh, hull types and there are some other parts i just wanted to point out quickly i'll show you some pictures of them so the main sheet traveler the main sheet is attached to the boom and it, it controls the angle of the mainsail to the wind and the main sheet traveler is just ordinarily it's a rail um, which helps you to set the angle then we have the winches and winches are just spools in a way that are used to trim your lines and sheets easily. So it, it can help you to have a bit of a lever and not haul in all your sheets by yourself. By the way, sheets are just ropes, <laughs> ropes that control sails. Then we have your compass. I think everybody's familiar with compasses, but the compass is mainly in the cockpit for navigation of course and the chart plotter which is the electronical counterpart to the compass and the chart plot is just a gps system that plots charts as well well of course your outboard motor most sailboats have an outboard motor and even bigger ones use generally very small motors you don't need a lot of power because of the whole type of sailboats the displacement hole it's very efficient and my last part for you today is the anchor and most sailboats carry at least one anchor most blue water offshore sailboats cruisers use three anchors so the bow anchor is the first one and the other two are stern anchors which provide extra stability 
So moving on to the next page. The front hatch was thrown open and Mary appeared. We're sinking, she screamed. The decks are smashed. We're full of water. Take the wheel, I shouted as I scrambled for the hatch. Uh, now the hatch is the uh, part where you go under the ship, where you go below decks. That's what it's called. That's why it's called the hatch. So you open it, you go below decks. Now she's saying the decks are smashed. We're full of water. Now usually what happens is like either the side of the ship gets smashed or the top of the ship gets smashed and water starts sloshing into the ship. Okay, so when she says the decks are smashed, that means the top part of the ship has been smashed. And that's why every time like a wave goes over the ship, it brings in water inside the ship. All right. So the narrator gives her the wheel, gives her the responsibility of steering the ship. And then he runs inside um, below deck. Okay. Larry and Herb were pumping like madmen. Broken timbers hung at crazy ankles. The whole starboard side bulged inwards. Clothes, crockery, charts, stems and toys sloshed about in deep water. So once again, I've explained this in the online lecture. Pumps means like whenever there's water inside your ship, you have like pumps and you have to pump it out because if there is more water inside the ship than outside, the ship will sink. Okay, I half swam, half crawled into the children's cabin. Now, why is he half swimming, half crawling? Is because like the deck is a confined space and if there is water inside the deck, there's not a lot of room to maneuver. There's not a lot of room to walk. Uh, if you've ever seen Titanic, uh, you would notice like whenever there's like uh, the scene where they're showing people trying to escape from the hallways and water rushing in, it's really hard for them to walk through. So that's the reason why he's half swimming and half crawling. Are you all right? He asked. Yes, they answered from an upper bunk, but my head hurts a bit, said Sue, pointing to a big bump over her eyes. I had no time to worry about bumped heads. Now in here, like this line might sound a little bit callous, but uh, it's actually the same thing. So if they drown, if the ship... Uh, goes underwater and capsizes like the bummed head will be the least of their worries right so that's why he has no time to worry about it after finding a hammer screws and canvas i struggled back on deck with the starboard side bashed open we were taking water with each wave that broke over us all right now explain port and starboard to you guys as well like port and starboard are alternative names for left and right in the navy so look them up as well Somehow I managed to stretch canvas and secure waterproof hatch covers across the gaping holes on the ship. Some water continued to stream below, but most of it was now being deflected over the sides. All right. More problems arose when a hand pump started to block up with the debris floating around the cabins and the electric pump short circuited. The water level rose threateningly. Back on the deck, I found out that our two spare hand pumps had been wrenched overboard along with the four stay tail, the jib, the dinghies and the main anchor. Alright, now these are all nautical terms. These are all ship terms. I'm not going to explain to them. You have to find out the meanings on your own. The video that I've put in this uh, lecture has like the explanation about what everything else is called. So pay attention to that. Try to figure this out on your own. Otherwise, like you can understand like the story is pretty simple. It's not very complicated. This is just like a sequence of events happening. This is like a retelling of an actual event. So this is not very poetic and it's not does not have like very difficult language. Alright. Then I remembered we had another electric pump under the chart room floor. I connected it to an outpipe and was thankful to find that it worked. The night dragged on with an endless, bitterly cool routine of pumping, steering and working the radio. All right. We were not getting no, rep no reply. Excuse me. We were getting no replies to our mayday calls, which was not surprising in this remote corner of the world. Sue's head had swollen alarmingly. She had two enormous black eyes and now she showed us a deep cut on her arm. When I asked her why she hadn't made more of her injuries before this, she replied, I didn't want to worry you when you were trying to save us all. All right, now this is the point of the story. This is like the exact point of the story is like how a family deals with adversity together, you know. Uh, what is their family structure? What is their family dynamic? And this is what the story is exploring, not the other part and everything else. Yes, this is an adventure story about a ship getting lost in a storm, but this is also a story about a family dealing with adversity together. All right. By morning on January 3rd, the pumps had the water level sufficiently under control for us to take two hours rest and rotation. But we still had a tremendous leak somewhere below the water line. Okay. Now below the water line, I've explained like a ship rides in the water. Like, you know, there is ballast. So if you're riding deeper in the water, that means you might have a smoother ride, but it might be difficult for you to control your ship. You might ride high on the water, which will give you more speed and increase controllability, but it will also make the ride rougher for you. So this page is done. Let's move on and I'll find another clip that explains like how bilge pumps and everything else works. So in the next page, the author talks about how the main rib frames were smashed down to the keel. In fact, there was nothing holding up a whole section of the starboard hull except a few cupboard partitions. Now, all of these things, the rib frames and everything else, uh, I'll put a video here after this, which is uh, somebody building like a modern wooden yacht. So you'll understand like what I mean by the ribs of the hull and what he says like the ribs were broken and everything else right down to the keel. So I'll put it here in the video and you can understand like you know 
how it's made and what the ribs are and everything else. So their ship was completely smashed up. There was nothing holding up. Like, uh, you know, there was only bits and pieces inside that were holding the ship together. We had survived for 15 hours since the wave hit, but the wave walker couldn't hold together long enough for us to reach Australia. I checked our charts and calculated that there were two small islands a few hundred kilometers to the east. One of them, Amsterdam, was a French scientific base. Our only hope was to reach these pinpricks in the vast ocean. Uh, this is, I think, Anjali told me pinpricks in the vast ocean means islands. So she, you were right. I was uh, wrong, basically. I was talking about a metaphor. You actually told me like where the paragraph was. So good job. Our only hope was to reach these pinpricks in the vast ocean. But unless the wind and the seas abated so we could hoist sail, our chances would be slim indeed. The great wave had put our auxiliary engine out of action. Now, auxiliary engine means like a backup engine. So usually like these giant sailboats, usually uh, the wooden sailboats uh, were mainly propelled by sails, but they also had like small engines attached to them, which were not their primary source of power. But whenever they needed like some extra uh, thrust or extra maneuverability, they could use that engine. But since the wave had hit their engine and their engine wasn't working, so they were just reliant on the seas. On January 4th, after 36 hours of continuous pumping, we reached the last few centimeters of water. Now we had only to keep pace with the water still coming in. We could not set any sail on the main mast. Pressure on the rigging would simply pull the damaged section of the hull apart. So we hoisted the storm jib and headed for where I thought the two islands were. Mary found some corned beef and cracker biscuits and we made our first meal in almost two days. Alright, like I said, this is all technical nautical terms. So main mass, rigging, pressure on the rigging would simply pull the damage section of the hull apart. Uh, like I said, all parts of the ship are interconnected. They're all tied together. They all function together as a unit. So like if something is damaged and then you put extra pressure on some place else, it's going to tear the entire thing apart. Okay, so corned beef is a kind of tinned beef that uh, Britishers usually eat and cracker biscuits are like plain graham crackers. Uh, so you, they ate something after two, uh, their first meal in almost two days. So you can imagine like, you know, pumping water continuously for 36 hours is not an easy thing. Uh, but our respite was short lived at 4 PM. Black clouds began building up behind us within the hour. The wind was back to 40 knots and the seas were getting higher. So now those of us who calculated speed, you can calculate this wind speed as well, 40 knots and the seas were getting higher. The weather continued to deteriorate throughout the night. And by dawn on January 5, our situation was again desperate. When I went in to comfort the children, John asked, Daddy, are we going to die? I tried to assure him that we would make it. But Daddy, he went on, we aren't afraid of dying, dying if we can all be together, you and Mummy, Sue and I. I could find no words with which to respond, but I left the children's cabin determined to fight the sea with everything I had. To protect the weakened starboard side, I decided to heave to with the undamaged port hull facing the oncoming waves, using an improvised sea anchor of heavy nylon rope and two 22-litre plastic barrels of paraffin. <clears throat> That evening, Mary and I sat together holding hands, and as the motion of the ship brought more and water into the broken plants, we both felt the end was very near. Okay, I'll stop here, and I'll stop this video here as well, because uh, I need to explain a little bit more about the philosophy, and I can't really go through it much, so... Uh, people, please join the online lecture, all right, because we need to talk about this. So this, his kid says, like, Daddy, are we going to die? And he uh, says, but uh, we aren't afraid of dying if we can all be together, you and Mummy and Sue and I. Now, uh, this would make a lot more sense to me. This would have a lot more emotional impact if this was somebody who had an actual life. But this is a six-year-old. Like, he's been alive for six years old. He has literally no concept of life. And he's saying we are not afraid of dying. So, like, yeah. I don't really get it. I don't really understand it. That's why I want to have this debate with you guys in the online lecture. I want to discuss with you guys what you think, what he said, why did he say the way he did and was it the right thing to say. So make sure you have your answers ready. Please ignore the noise in the background. I live right next to the railway station and there is nothing I can do about it. Okay, so make sure that you have your answers ready for this. Like why did his son say we are uh, ask him why is, are they going to die? Why does his son say we aren't afraid of dying? And we'll discuss like what this actually means. You know, what does this emotionally mean? And after this section, I'll put a video about Isle Amsterdam. So you can actually see what Isle Amsterdam looks like where they were trying to land. And I'll put another video as well. So make sure you watch through the entire thing. And then I'll be giving you notes and question and answers and everything else via PDF. Okay, but make sure you pre uh, prepare like the questions that I've asked. Make sure that you're ready for this debate when you join the online lecture tomorrow. Anyways, let's just move on to the footage and I think we're done for today.